Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the BallQuest.com Mailbag Podcast brought to you by our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or visit them online at or on Twitter at BlueH2O underscore climate. Again, you can set all your appointments up online through their online site. Uh, you can find out all about Blue Water Climate Control. We'll be telling you more about them a little bit later on in the podcast. they got a great deal going for you this summer. Uh, you'll hear more about that but the great time to check them out for any of your uh heating and air needs that's blue water climate control with austin price and rob lewis i'm brent hubs glad to have you along with us we'll jump right into um uh, let's jump into the schedule thing first because this is a hot topic everybody's talking about austin i'll start with you uh, the thought process is that there's some kind of news coming today uh there was a thought that there might be news coming about it coming on it on thursday and it didn't happen does it sound like, as we mentioned in the Thursday Nuggets, that they're going to announce the full schedule, just who your two new opponents are? I said this two weeks ago. It made the most sense, or a week ago, it made the most sense just to add the next two opponents. Sounds like, Austin, though, in talking to some people, part of this deal is getting 14 athletic directors to agree on everybody's two new teams is a lot harder than – well, it's as hard as we thought it would be. Let's put it that way. Which, in reality, is also trying to get 14 head coaches to agree because – there's no real fair way to do it, but I think the thing that's the fairest is to do what you just mentioned, which is to take the 21 and 22 opponents and just go because there's nothing subjective about that. It is, you know, already figured out. It's already on the schedule. Boom, go. You know, if you go like strength to schedule and all this stuff, at some point, it's going to look, you know, you're bringing the human element into this. Whereas now there's not, it's already, it's already predetermined. Tennessee would pick up Ole Miss and LSU. Florida would pick up Alabama, which means, means Alabama, who I continue to be told is not too happy with the whole 21, 22, uh, you know, situation um, would have the big three in the East, you know, or the traditional big three in the East, Tennessee, Florida, and Georgia on their schedule, which would make things tougher for the Crimson Tide. But if you go off the theory that we've talked about, that we've continued to hear, which is A&M and whether it's Auburn or LSU, and I think it probably will be LSU. It just makes more sense because they've not played them of late. Um, that, that's a death knell for Tennessee. You know, I mean, like, that, that means Tennessee would play five of the top 13 teams in the country in a 10-game SEC schedule. Even if you're good, you're going to get beat up doing that. And this is a program that's, that's not going to win those type of games consistently. All of a sudden, you're asking them to play five of the top 13 at, in their 10-game schedule. Well, that beckons, that beckons this question, Rob. I mean, if, that, if that's what ends up being the case, if Tennessee does play five of the top, you know, five top 15 teams nationally, top 13 teams nationally, what what is realistic expectations for Tennessee in a 10-win season? I mean, look, everybody talked about taking the next step, beating the teams you're supposed to beat, then winning one of the four against the big boys. What is it now if that's what Tennessee's 10-game schedule looks like? I mean, is a good year for Jeremy Pruitt 5-5? Five and five? Is it 6-4? I think that's a bad four? year. I think, I mean, if that's the schedule, if those are the two teams you add, 6-4 is a good – I mean, a really good year. I mean, 6-4 I mean, and four means that you beat everybody you were supposed to beat and won one of those five and, and pulled an upset you know beat somebody that you hadn't beaten you know in in ages in in florida georgia alabama or you know the defending national champ or you know a texas a m program that's got some momentum so i mean i think in that scenario if tennessee goes 500 then you know jeremy can with a straight face make the argument that you know they're making progress and yeah. then next year and next year, you, you need to win one of those games. Yeah, you, you better you, you better make hay, you better make hay in another year. But but if you go five and five with the, if that's your schedule, and you go five and five. That that's not that's not just hor that's not a horrific year when you look no, at. I mean, it. I mean, you cemented you cemented what you started last year, which is you got Tennessee at least back beating the Kentuckys, the Vanderbilts, the South Carolinas, Missouri. I mean, that's that that has to happen with this program. I mean, you, you've at least kind of established two years in a row that you have pulled this thing, 
you know, out, out of the depths from where it sunk in Butch's last year. Well, and so we'll see what happens with the, the SEC uh, throughout the day-to-day, whether or not they um, announce who those teams are, whether they can get everybody to sign off on it. Um, the, the bottom line is if they're going to do it this way, somebody, if everybody signs off on it, somebody's not going to be happy and the league is going to catch scrutiny for playing favorites because of the way that they've handled this and, and brought in, as you mentioned, the human element, Austin, uh, and, and subject themselves to criticism. But that's the decision that they elected to make when they initially, the, the, everybody you talked to, the initial thought behind the scenes was they were just going to add the next two opponents until they got enough blowback from, uh, as you mentioned, head coaches through athletic directors and university presidents for them not to go that way. So we'll see. All right, let's jump into the questions here. And we'll start with our first one. It kind of piggybacks off this. Why is the SEC so openly anti-UT? It's beyond comical. Will it ever change as long as the headquarters is in Birmingham? I love this notion. I love this question because everybody in the league, when Doug Dickey was the athletics director, Rob, and Roy Kramer was running the, the SEC, was the SEC commissioner, it was about how Tennessee got all the favorite. Everything was, everything was slanted towards Tennessee because old Roy was an old Blunt County guy. He liked Tennessee. And Doug Dickey controlled everything in the league office. And so everybody else in the conference was mad because Tennessee ran the league office. And now the thought process is that Tennessee doesn't basically have a say at the table on various things. So that's certainly not the case. But um, it's interesting kind of how the worm changes and how things turn when you're winning and you're on top. It's, it's a very different narrative from a lot of people than it is when you're struggling to try to get back to where you were. Well, yeah, I, think, I mean, go ahead, Rob. I was just say, I mean, I don't believe in, you know, the, all these vast conspiracies, but I do think it's, I mean, I've always thought it's kind of a bad look that um, the SEC office was in Birmingham. I don't know. I mean, I think you could put it in Nashville where, you know, Vanderbilt, nobody cares about Vanderbilt. Um, put it in Atlanta. I mean, Georgia's close, but, you know, Atlanta is such a metropolis that, you know, it's a melting pot for the SEC. So, you know, I mean, I don't think it's a, a huge deal, but I, I, I do understand why people, you know, 13 other schools, fans of 13 other schools don't don't like the fact that it's there. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I think more than anything is, you know, Tennessee fans feel that way because, you know, you've had certain rulings go against them over the years, whether it go back, a, you know, and I know it's, it's NCAA, not SEC, but I think everybody just kind of lumps – everything in together that everything's against them so like euros plosic you know originally ineligible here we are waiting on Cade, even though tennessee didn't turn his eligibility in or the the waiver uh into late and here you know georgia already got jt daniels you know so i mean i think people just after a decade plus of things working against you i think it's just natural for tennessee fans to feel like the other shoe's going to drop and it's going to be tennessee playing Three of the four big, three of the big four from the West, where Florida and Georgia only had to play two of the big four, and that gives them an easier path to winning the division, yeah. and, and keep and keeps Tennessee buried, so to speak, Hubs. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, you're. Just, I mean, it again. In the '90s, everybody was talking about how Tennessee got all the favorable rulings, and it's because a lot of times when you're on top, that's what it looks like. That's how it's perceived. I do agree with what Rob is saying, though. It's not a great look that it's in Birmingham, particularly when Alabama is, is winning the way Alabama has been winning. All right, over and under Austin, two and a half August commits, including 22s. Give me a yes or no, over or under. Two and a half commits in August, including class of 22s. Under. Under, taking the under there. All right, let's go to Bassmaster Vol. When is uh, Christian Zachary going to announce? If picking today, where does TID land? And is Tennessee surging with Nylon Green? Well, I think right now, I think Tennessee's really in a nice position for TID. Um, again, though, he's not made his decision up. I, I talked to him two nights ago at length. We'll have a story on him this weekend. He really likes Chris Winkie, loves the Tennessee staff. He's not made his mind up. It's still between it, – it really is between three. I mean, like, he's pretty much eliminated everybody else. I mean, so you got he Georgia, doesn't consider – Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee. Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee. Alabama's out. Uh, you know, Virginia Tech, North Carolina. He does not consider himself a quote ACC player. <laughs> I mean, like, which I agree. I mean, you know, hey, when you're when you're when when you're an SEC school, that's what you're telling those kids. You go to Clemson, you're an ACC guy. You're an SEC guy. Um, 
so I do think that, um, you know, Tennessee's positioned well there. As for Nyland Green, Georgia and Tennessee seem to have a lot of smoke. It was Clemson. Then Clemson fell hard because they were trying to get him in the boat. Auburn ascended. Now, Auburn has pushed this kid to get in the boat and fallen like a rock. I guess what we've learned is don't push Nyland Green to try to get in the boat. He's going to go at his own pace. Tennessee and Georgia right now are the two trendy teams for him, the, one, the ones with the most chatter. So, yes, Tennessee is, is much better positioned now than they were six weeks ago, even three weeks ago. But I think this one's going to take a little bit longer. Georgia is just down the road. We made that comment when we went and saw him back in March hubs. That one makes a ton of sense from just a location standpoint. But he does like Pruitt. He does like Ansley. And Tennessee's got – a much better shot now than they did just a few weeks ago. Yeah, and mama's a factor in that too. Don't 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 downplay that one. It's the kid's own oh, decision. Mom's going to have a heavy influence though. Yeah, you know, a heavy heavy influence. Tennessee's done a really nice job of including, you know, her or the rest of the family and with Nylon on these zooms. You know, the kid wants to look at criminal justice uh, potentially. She's a lawyer. Tennessee's got some former players that are lawyers. They've done a nice job of getting those those guys on Zooms and, you know, talk to them about, you know, life after football. Christian Zachary doesn't have a timeline, right? No, he doesn't. Uh, you know, he's just like I, – I put this in the war room. He reminds me a lot of Diego Pounds. Just kind of uh, likes the trendy, flashy object teams like, you know, LSU, Alabama, Ohio State, Oklahoma. I think they're both kind of wishing one of those teams would really ascend for them. I don't think either kid right now is to the point, you know, where those teams are pushing that hard. I think Alabama is a small factor for Christian, but I can't say that they're a heavy factor. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think either one of those guys is ready to do something quite yet. All right. Steven Belanzo Jackson would like to know, what's the absolute latest, Rob Lewis, on Kennedy Chandler and is a decision coming soon? I don't think a decision's coming soon. I'm basing the fact on what he told. I mean, I, I talk with Eric Bossy a lot, our national analyst guy. Eric spoke with his dad two weeks ago when all this commitment chatter was in the air. His dad was, you know, emphatic. That they weren't doing anything early. They're waiting to see, you know, when this dead period gets lifted, which sidebar, I'm hearing some chatter tonight that it's going to be extended well past August 31st. And um, then Eric had a chance to see Kennedy in person at a tournament. Kennedy told him the same thing, wanted to take visits. Now, I will say, if this dead period lasts and he's not able to take visits, I, mean, I love Tennessee's chances. I and mean, I, like, I like Tennessee's chances now. And if he picks today, based on people I'm talking to, the chatter that's out there, I think he's picking Tennessee. But I haven't had anybody tell me he's going to do it, you know, on this date. But I think Tennessee is in a really, really strong spot with him. And it does feel like that dead period for all sports and recruiting is going to get extended through the month of September anyway. Ross Bork, um, Texas A&M's athletic director, has been on record saying he does not think official visits are going to happen this fall in any sport. So we'll see if that uh, plays out. and We'll see what this dead period looks like moving forward. All right, Logan Bartlett wants to know, uh, have you heard any rumblings about Tennessee players setting out? Do both Cade and Trey play if there's a season in your opinion? If, if Cade's eligible and there's a season, Trey Smith and Cade Mays are going to be on the field playing for Tennessee. Austin, I've not heard rumblings of guys setting out. Things can change, but I have not heard that. I've not really heard that from anybody at Tennessee that I've spoken with. Me neither. You know, you had the kid on Thursday from Auburn that came out and is going to opt out in redshirt this year because he's got a little one at home, uh, those type of things. I mean, I, that kind of thing is certainly possible for any player. Um, but, you know, uh, I've not been told by anybody that Tennessee's got any kids looking to potentially opt out. But, hey, kids are kids. They could keep it to themselves and all of a sudden just, you know, pop up and announce. Well, and, and circumstances can change with somebody. You know, someone's grandparent or somebody has a family member that gets diagnosed. It can, it can have a different effect on you. So I think that's a day-to-day -day thing. But as of today, I've not heard of anybody at Tennessee talking about not playing. Vols 10-24 What's the plan when SEC players test positive? With thousands of college kids on campus, it's inevitable. This seems to be only protocol. This seems to be the only protocol that truly matters when planning a season. 
not going to bat a thousand, keeping all SEC players clear. What happens when they do? I'm told that the SEC is going to release a document that explains in detail um, what their protocol is leading up to games in terms of testing, what the protocol is going to be in terms of reporting, uh, you know, positives and what the protocol is going to be in terms of managing those positives. They have not released that document yet, uh, but I do anticipate that document coming uh, at some point. And, and the thought process is that document is going to answer a lot of these questions that, quite frankly, we don't know the answer to right now. And I'm not sure all the coaches know the answer to because I think it's been a moving target in what that protocol looks like. Obviously, schools are testing. Um, the NCAA has made it clear that, you know, competition weeks, you've got to test 72 hours before competition. Uh, that has to take place that way. Uh, but in exactly what the league is going to do in regards to positives when it comes to, to playing games and all that, I don't think anybody knows yet. I, I think that's still a work in, you know, just still a, a work in progress to try, try to sort through everything. I think that's in some ways, Rob, why the SEC starting September 26th. They're, they're going to see how the ACC does it a little bit. They're going to see what numbers look like around the country in the coming weeks. And it also gives them an extra month, you know, or so to get their plan completely in place. What we're seeing with a lot of school systems right now can't roll out at the, at the start date, not because of a bunch of kids that have tested positive. They're not ready. They don't have everything in place yet. And, and I think that's kind of where the SEC is. Yeah. And I also, th I mean, I, I agree with your point about more time, seeing how it works for, for other people. And I, mean, I, I just think that it's going to be – I'm saying you know, what they say, what the document you're talking about says. I mean, I think that, you know, policies can change depending on – Oh, yeah. On, on, you know, how things go, on how – what the numbers look like, on how, you know, just – and, I, and, I, and I, he mentioned it, what, what I think, outside of just football. I mean, these kids aren't a bubble. You know, there's going to be thousands of kids – on Tennessee's campus starting next week that, you know, they're going to be eating in cafeterias with and in classrooms with walking, you know, just walking in hallways with, it's going to be, it's not just about the football players, but I think it's. Are, are, are we surprised they've not shifted online? Well, I, I mean, I think the reason I've got, you guys know, I've got one that's moving into North Carrick on, um, on Sunday. And, uh, he's got, Oh, oh, oh that place is going to be destroyed by the weekend. <laughs> he's, uh, He's got two on. I mean, he's got one that out of his, you know, three. He's got three four-hour classes with, kind of, with labs. One is going to be hybrid, virtual labs will be in person, and the other two are in person, and they're going full speed ahead. And I think they're trying to, and I, I think finances are, are a big part of it. I mean, if you're going to go all virtual, you can't I mean, charge full price. How are you? Yeah, I mean, why am I going to pay room and board to you know for him to live on campus if he can just you know sit in his room and fire up his Mac now? Here's, here's what I wonder. How much will coaches, athletic directors, athletic personnel work on trying to get their kids and get their student athletes in as many online courses as they can to try to bubble them a bit? Okay. Oh, be try to keep them out of that. I think that's, I think that's what coaches are going to try to do. Look, you still can't, you still can't, you know, from eight o'clock at night to eight o'clock in the morning, you're still not sure what they're going to be doing. But I think coaches and administrators and now on the athletic side are going to do as much as they can to bubble the fall athletes and the winter athletes to try to make that thing work a little better. We'll see. I, but I, I, think just, gonna I just don't think it's just going to be impossible. I mean, they're, I mean, they're 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids. They, and they are high, Trust me, as, as the father of an 18 year old, they are hyper aware of how little of a threat the virus is to them and they live their life accordingly. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. I, I mean, again, I, I think you can bubble that all you want to. You just, you don't know what the, you can't control them. Eight p.m. to eight a.m. and and that's your biggest concern. And trying to keep the the virus, you know, to, to not mess up college football games. Let's go to uh, always or eight always twenty four, whatever his name is here. Sorry, buddy, I messed it up again this week. Anything <laughs> new on Mims and Colsey? I got his question in, man. All right, it's a Kobe Bryant reference. I mean, I understand it, but. I can't say it. Anyway, Austin, answer the question on Mims and Colsey. Talk to me. Uh, yeah, Tennessee is uh, – I'll say – I don't want to use the word surging because that makes them feel like that they're, like, rocketing up to the lead. Uh, but they are getting more and more traction with 
uh, Amarius Mims. Uh, both, as I had in the war room, both they and Auburn seem to be the teams that have got garnered more traction with him the last week or two. Uh, Georgia, Alabama. Alabama's got four linemen already committed. Um, they've already got the big tackle from Texas, Brocker Meyer, and, of course, his twin brother. Those two seems like they're kind of stuck in neutral a little bit. So I'm not saying Tennessee and, and Auburn have passed Georgia or Alabama, but I do feel like that they have rose up there right with them. All right, let's go to Ma Vol here, who's got questions, Rob Lewis, for you regarding basketball. Uh, with Ponds back and the newcomers, what's your best thought on a two deep for this basketball team? And who's the uh, who are the odd men out? Who's going to have a I don't want to say odd men out. Who do you think is going to have a hard time getting minutes? I'm going to amend his question here. But who's in a real fight for minutes with, with uh, this team? I mean, I think with Ponds going back and with all the front court depth, I think they're going to be able to redshirt Drew Pember, which I, they wanted to do last year, and it just didn't work out that way with Plavsic being not being eligible. Uh, the two deep, the guy, uh, Anna Sicky is going to be the first post guy off the bench. Um, then it's going to be between – Camwa and and Eurosh to see who you know gets whatever spot minutes are left there. Uh, this co between the, this Kobe Josiah and Victor Bailey, whoever doesn't win the starting point point guard job, those two guys are going to be coming off the bench and they'll play big minutes. Whoever you know the the two odd men are, out. I think they'll play nine guys, five starters, Anastiki, Camwa or Plazic, and then either James Viscovi or. Sonny um, Bailey. Yeah. Okay. I mean, a lot and of Gaines depth. is going to have a hard time. Gaines is going to have a hard time getting minutes. He could. I mean, I don't know that he wants to redshirt. I think Pember is really open to it. I mean, Drew knows he could use a year. I don't know if Gaines wants to. And uh, Corey Walker, I think this doesn't say says nothing about his ability. I just think with what Tennessee has coming back, he's going to have a hard time playing this year. All Much. right. All right. Ball sixty eight sixty eight. Which new coach in football do you expect to see? the biggest jump in the position they are coaching running backs. Are we all on board running backs? I, I think the combination of Jay being a good coach and Eric Gray being, being better than he was as a freshman will, will make it look like he's had a huge impact. Uh, you know, I, I can see that. My only question with that position is just, there's not a lot of depth. So, you know, to me, Jay's going to get his make it, you know, he's going to earn his money, you know, because he's going to have to bring on along T Hodge, or Jabari Small, or somebody, or, you know, or, or Whitehead, who's still got a, a foot deal. I don't know. He'll, I think he may redshirt. Um, and so, I mean, so, I mean, he's got to bring on one of those two, Hodge or Small, to play, you know, meaningful snaps. I mean, it, you know, Tennessee played three backs easily a year ago, leaves them with no wiggle room for injuries, which, you know, can easily happen at that position because you're always taking a pounding. So, you know, I'm going to be interested to see what Tennessee does. Uh, who Who – is that emergency tailback? Is it Jeremy Banks flipping back to offense? Is it Jimmy Holiday going to running back? Is it Bayless Jones playing some in the, in the backfield, uh, you know, with Tennessee having a, a little kind of a jitterbug like him? All right, so what new coach do you think is going to have the biggest jump in the position? I'm going to go with Jimmy Brumball. Right. Uh, I, think that, I think Jimmy's – one, I just think that all those guys are a year older – which means they're going to be a year better and a year more consistent. Now, is it fractional better? Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't – but I still think that they have a good improvement. I just don't know if there's enough quality – I mean, I think there's quality players, but not quality experience at outside backer. So, I, that's why I think it's going to be hard for it to be that position. And we all know Joe just has little to nothing at tight end at this point. All right, let's go to volunteer to 87. Back to hoops for you, Rob Lewis. What was going through Ponza's mind, mind the last 24 hours? Anything in particular that swayed him back to UT uh, besides the lack of clarity on his draft stock with no combine? What, what was, what I mean, was the back talking, and forth? And I haven't talked to Eves, but I've talked to a lot of people close to the situation. I think it was just the uncertainty. I mean, just, you know, the, the kind of in limbo, having no, you know, your agent can talk to, guys i'm sure you know rick certainly got feedback and, and, and shared it with him but without actually being able to work out in person i mean there was just so much uncertainty and um you know if you go don't get picked you know you're looking at and i, I mean i don't think going overseas is you know the blow to eves that it would be to you know somebody else having you know grown up in europe 
But, uh, you know, he, he's serious about playing in the NBA, thinks he can play in the NBA, and just was not, you know, willing to take that risk. And I, it's hard to blame him. And it's just a weird time. Vol, I am. Austin, to you. Our last – Tennessee's last two commits – Maybe total 300 pounds. Do they get a 300-pound guy in August? When's the beef coming? <laughs> he keeps asking. That was the best part, knowing that J.T. Carver was going to commit, and he said, and I've been able to say under. <laughs> oh, geez. Is there some beef uh, yeah, coming I mean, in August? I think, I think – no, I don't think anybody's committing in August. I mean, you know, unless TID does. And, again, I'm not sold that he's actually going to do it. Got gotcha. you. Like, you know, I, he, I know he intends to. He wants to. But in let, he's not one – for a kid that likes to get all the love on Twitter and is constantly tweeting turkey emojis at Virginia Tech fans and orange emojis at Tennessee fans and so on and so forth, he's not a kid that wants to commit and then still keep being recruited and go through it all again. He When he commits, he wants to be done. Like, there, you know, there was a difference with, like, you know, some of these kids that – when they – I mean, look at uh, – you know, Terrence Lewis. I mean, Terrence Lewis, he's on Twitter every day flirting with Nebraska and LSU and everybody. I don't think Tyrion wants to do that. Uh, I think when well, he does it, he wants to be done. So I, that's why I'm, I'm skeptical of him going actually in August. Maybe he does, but we've seen that movie before when he was going to do it in May, and he was going to do it in June, and it just never has happened. So, you know, let, let, let's see, you know, when we get middle of August, see where we're at there. So, potentially, that could be him, even though he's not really 300 pounds. Um, but as far as offensive linemen, we all know William Parker's doing something September 4th. And as of right now, I still think Tennessee's got the best chance of anyone. All right. VFL Country wants to know how the ball's looking with Ken Talley. Ken Talley, get out of uh, the Northeast. I do not think Tennessee was willing to uh, go down that road right now. Right. I think that they, they needed him to come camp those type of things that did not happen. He's a 2022. So I know he's getting ready to do something here in the coming weeks. I do not expect Tennessee to be that pick. All right. Volgrad 05, two quick questions. Is Carver basically guaranteed a scholarship after his first year? And Austin, how many uh, commitment videos have you filmed for prospects that never got, that you never got to post? Oh, uh, there's been a few. There has been a few, you know, uh, uh, Cam Jones being one, uh, obviously, uh, our boy that went to Kentucky last yeah, year, Justin Rogers. Uh, uh, I think there may be one more. I don't, yeah. I don't know. It all runs together at this point. I, I think Carver gets a scholarship pretty quickly because I think he's I think he's in a great position to have a chance to be Tennessee's kicker next fall because he's coming in at midterm, uh, and I think he will get to scholar he will get to the scholarship whenever he can get to a scholarship. in, in terms of him not counting it as an initial. I think that's Agreed. where that's at. All right, uh, Jay Farmer, 810, what's the latest on Cade Mays' waiver? Um, and any backstory on why Tennessee did not uh, file any, any sooner? Is this a fixable – it seems like a fixable problem. Why didn't they file sooner? Which we've Hold talked. on, let me, uh, let me text him. Oh, oh <laughs> no, still nothing. Uh, you nothing know, I, I mean, like, there's no update until it, it's just going to – it's just going to come out. It's not like it's going to slowly leak out that – Oh, I think he may get it. I mean, it's just going to be boom. He got, you know, he got it, or boom, he got denied. You know, one way or the other. Um, you know, as for why they didn't, because I think Tennessee and the, you know, those things, you're making an argument as to why a kid should be granted immediate eligibility. So it's like you know, it's almost like a court case in a lot of ways. So you're having to present all these different, um, you know, documents and and all these type of things. I think Tennessee was waiting to see if the one-time waiver passed. Because if that was going to pass, there wasn't going to be a need for everybody to go through all of that work. You know, that that was the great misnomer. All these Vol fans thought that the moment that he decided to come home, that Tennessee just was like, oh, there's the paperwork. Here you go. You know, it didn't work that way a year ago with Aubrey Solomon. I mean, well, and you also had a lawyer involved, and then the lawyer reclused himself. And so suddenly now you got to do your own work and get your own things together. And some of that timing didn't exactly – um, jive yeah jive real well for you to get something done early either all right l bankman wants to know ticket prices assuming demand is consistent with previous years and a 75 percent reduction in supply do you think the university will significantly adjust ticket prices i don't think ticket prices are going to change this year i, I think if they're on the market 
on the streets, they're going to be different, but I don't think the ticket office prices are going to be any different. I think they're set. a tough look in this current climate with everything yeah. going on. I don't think any, I don't think anybody's going to do that. All right, Volken, Rick Barnes and his staff have made the reputation on development. Who on this team is looked at as the next player to take a big leap based on this what this staff thinks and what they've been able to do in the past? Uh, I think the guy you're going to see make the biggest leap this year is Josiah. And I think it's mostly because he's going to be healthy. I think you're going to see him be able to do a lot more things. And I don't think it's coming this year with him, but one guy, I mean, I think he'll be better, but um, I think Cam Watt is a guy you watch. Not necessarily. I mean, I think he'll be better as a sophomore, but I think he's a guy junior year and will be a noticeably different. Remember that's kind of how it happened for Admiral. I mean, he was better as a sophomore, but the big jump came in year three. And uh, I'd throw Pember in that boat too. I think people, I, People that write Pember off, uh, I don't think are uh, are giving him his due. Not many kids his size can ha- have the skills he has. All right, Pine Mountain Ball. If you have to pick a freshman to start on defense this year, or you have to pick a freshman to start on defense, doesn't have to be game one, uh, but before the season is over, give a freshman on defense that's going to start. AP. Ooh, man, I'll go. Uh, I'll go Keyshawn Lawrence. Okay. I mean, I, I think he's the most logical pick at some point, I guess. I mean, something might be because of injury. But they've got depth at other places where you don't have to count on a freshman as a, as a defensive lineman. Now, I think some freshmen are going to play in rotations. But in terms of starting, um, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with Keyshawn Lawrence. Uh, final question, then we're out the gate. This is from ATX Vol. What are the ramifications for small colleges and their sports teams and budgets now that many, if not all, their football games have been canceled uh, with big with big teams that are used to run their sports programs. I think small schools are in trouble. I think small schools are in trouble playing this year uh, because I think they're not going to have the financial resources to go through all the protocols and to be able to do all the things that the NCAA is going to mandate you to have to do. And I think you're going to see uh, some small schools announce in the coming weeks. They've got until middle of the month to declare whether they're going to play. And I think a lot of schools are not going to be able to play because I don't think it's going to be financially feasible to, for them to do that this year. And um, I, I think it's going to be hard for them to recover moving forward, because I think this is, uh, you know, not having $500,000 if you're ETSU for playing Georgia is a big deal. That's a huge blow to your, to your football budget. That's a huge blow to your athletic budget. So we'll see what happens with them moving forward. But I think you're going to see announcements of some schools not being able to play this fall for financial reasons more than you are for specific COVID reasons in terms of guys being positive, but simply they just can't financially manage um, the pandemic with their football program the way a power five school can. Hey, I mentioned to you earlier about blue water climate control. One of the smartest things you can do to get your home ready for the high heat and humidity uh, is to get blue water climate control, 7999 trouble free tune up. This tune up comes with two unheard of guarantees. First, they know, that if you don't have the thorough detailed tune-up on your air conditioner, you're going to waste a lot of money on your energy bills. So if they tune up your home's energy home system and your energy bills don't change, you don't save at least $100 on the summer utility bill, they're going to refund you that $79.99. So you get your money back if you don't see the benefits of the tune-up. Second, Blue Water's tune-up can also prevent many costly repairs. If your air conditioner breaks down this summer after you've had this tune-up, the repair is discounted 20%. It's easier than ever to make an appointment. Go to bluewaterclimatecontrol.com, select book online. You can choose the date and time slot that works best for you. You can also book repair appointments and AC replacement estimates. Or always, you can just call them at 865-299-2290 for all of your air conditioning needs. That's our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us on our Friday Mailbag Podcast. Have a great weekend, everybody.